Hello, 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 and welcome to our last and final Zoom session for 110 Acoustics and Psychoacoustics. Today we finish Unit 7, which is Non-Electronic Acoustic Modifications in Hearing Aids. Last week we started this unit, this week we'll finish this unit. I think last week we also showed you some hearing aids, behind-the-ear hearing aids. You can see the pieces and the parts. This would be the battery door. This would be the on and off switch. Here would be a volume wheel going up and down. And then this I said here was the microphone that picks up all the sound. The hearing aid makes the sound increased. And then the sound is sent out through the second hole here called the speaker. And in hearing aid lingo, we call that the receiver. So the top hole is the mic, the bottom one is the receiver, in other words, the speaker. And a mic and a speaker are both transducers. They change sound energy from one form to another form. A mic changes sound waves into electricity, and a speaker changes electricity into sound waves. So ba basically, a speaker is a backward mic. A mic is a backward speaker. A frown is an upside down smile. A smile is an upside down frown, okay? Transducers, important words. This is an ear hook, and the ear hook is twisted onto the hearing aid. If I can do that here, twist this puppy on, okay? Here we go. And then we said this is an ear mold that's customized to your ear. In other words, you will be taking ear mold impressions on people's ears and then sending out to get an ear mold made for that person. And the ear mold fits onto the hook like thus, okay? And basically, there's the tubing. The tubing is called number 13 tubing. And last week, too, we discussed two kinds of ear molds, didn't we? This one's silicone. You can bend it. Okay, this ear mold here on another behind the ear hearing aid, this one's plexiglass, okay, made out of lucite. Again, a different hearing aid. Both of these are called BTEs, behind the ear hearing aids. And in this mold, you'll see a two tunnels, and one's for the sound coming through the tube, and the other one was the vent. And the vent was the first of our non-electronic acoustic modifications. And we said last week the purpose of a vent was to increase acoustic mass of air trapped in the ear behind the mold. Because now you've, al you've allowed the, the air trapped behind to communicate with the air outside. And what resonates with mass? Lows. So the lows are going to follow that mass. And so what events do? They reduce the occlusion effect by letting the low frequencies out of the ear. And we said last week that because when you plug your ear and you talk, you hear your own voice louder. And that's called the occlusion effect. Vents are in hearing aids to reduce the occlusion effect. Then I showed you a great big in-the-ear hearing aid, where the whole hearing aid is made inside the mold itself. These are falling out of style. You don't see these very much anymore. But look at the two holes again. The white one is for the sound to come out, and the bottom one is the vent. Looking at the faceplate of the hearing aid, you'll see a battery door. So I'll open it up here. And you'll see a volume control wheel at the bottom here, and you'll see a mic at the top. So the mic and the speaker or the receiver, and you'll see the vent starting over here. You can see the letters in red. That means it's a right ear hearing aid. If the letters were in blue, it would be a left ear hearing aid. I-T-E, in the ear. B-T-E, behind the ear. And then I-T-E's got smaller, so they became I-T-C's in the canal. Now, I'll hold this one up, and you can see its microphone and its battery door. I'll open up the battery door here. And you can see this hearing aid even has a little piece of fishing line on it. That's so that the user can grab it and pull it out of the ear, okay? This one here also is a right ear hearing aid because the writing on it is red. 
And you'll notice again the two holes, one for the speaker, the white one, the receiver, and the other one, the vent. And if you turn the hearing aid around, okay, you can see that little hole at the bottom. That's the vent. ITC, in the canal. Then you'll see a hearing aid, really small. This one's a left ear hearing aid. This one's a CIC, completely in canal, really small. This one's barely even got a vent. It does, though, if you look. Yep. When your hearing aids get really, really small, you start to lose what they call physical real estate in the ear. Okay? So it becomes harder and harder to put all the little components in. The vents in these hearing aids are often smaller. But here, if you take a look, you'll see a vent at the bottom. See that little hole? And you'll see the mic which is right there, and the, the battery door. This one doesn't even have a volume control on it, okay? Then you get to today's hearing aids, thin tube hearing aids. So thin tube hearing aids, very, very small, behind the ear has come, has come back. And I showed you last week this weird little tail. That little tail is to fit inside the concha bowl. And the hearing aid, basically, if I hold one up closely, has a stock, just a dome. See that? See all the holes in it? So if I hold this guy up, I don't know, it's kind of hard to show on, on, on a Zoom session here, but maybe if I just see if I can grab it like, there, look at all the holes in it. Three big holes, okay? And that's at the end of the tubing, okay? So this is called a thin tube hearing aid. Actually, the one here, this is a thin tube hearing aid, and I'll contrast it to a RIC, okay? This is a thin tube. Just like the behind-the-ear hearing aid, okay, it has, a th it has a tube and an ear mold, a stock ear mold this time, just, just not custom-made, okay? And the sound goes through the ear hook and through the tubing. But see, this tubing here is called number 13 tubing. Number 13 tubing has an internal diameter, if I pull this off, it has an internal diameter of 2 millimeters. That's kind of hard to show again, okay, but I'm holding the, the here's the tubing. If There you go. See the hole there? That's 2 millimeters wide. Number 13 tubing always has 2 millimeter diameter. Thin tube hearing aids... The diameter inside this tubing is less than one millimeter. To be exact, 0.8 to 0.9 millimeters. Remember that. It could very well be a final exam question, okay? Number 13 tubing in conventional BTE hearing aids, okay? Thin tube hearing aids, okay? They're not using number 13 tubing. It's just called thin tube, and it's not two millimeters in diameter. It's less than one, 0.8 to 0.9. Then, okay, so there's your thin tube hearing aids. And then today we now have also receiver in canal hearing aids. Look, they look the same. They can't, they're the same kind of hearing aid. I mean, it's the same shape. It's got a little tube or anything, but I'm going to put the thin tube down now and to highlight and point out the fact that in this thin tube, which is hard for you to see, I know, okay, there's actually a thin wire. Sound isn't going through the thin tube. Uh-uh. The speaker itself, I'll take off the dome, okay? The speaker itself, the receiver, is here. Okay? It's no longer, like in the thin tube hearing aid, here. And in the behind-the-ear hearing aid here, okay, remember I showed you the mic and the receiver, okay, it's no longer that, uh-uh, now they put the speaker in the guy's ear canal. So what's running through the tube, no longer a hollow tunnel for sound to go through, uh-uh, a wire is connected. So the microphone is at the top, okay? You'll see the mic, let's see, there we go. The mic is this little thing right here. That's the mic, that little, those three little lines. 
and it's a hearing aid makes the sound louder. And then what, is it, what does the microphone do? Changes sound into electricity. The battery and the hearing aids make the electricity bigger. And the electricity is sent down the wire into the receiver. And on the receiver is the little dome. And I'll put the dome on the receiver. And there it is. This goes in the guy's ear. Okay, so this is a thin tube hearing aid. This is a receiver in canal hearing aid. The, the, the design is very similar. Same kind of stock little uh, domes used, okay? But in this case, sound is going through the tube, and in this case, electricity is going through the tube. It's, it's, a, it's a wire connected to the speaker. So you've got, got all the way from behind the ear to in the ear, in the canal, to CIC, completely in canal, to thin tube hearing aids, to receiver in canal hearing aids. Receiver in canal hearing aids are better than thin tube hearing aids because the speaker is closer to the eardrum. They usually are a bit more expensive, a little bit more expensive than thin tube hearing aids. You could say a thin tube hearing aid is kind of like a poor man's Rick. <laughs> Anyway, why don't we share a screen now and look at what we've done in our notes. Pull up the good old notes here. And last week we talked about the outer ear canal as a quarter wave resonator. No need to go over that. If you're looking here, well, by the way, do know this, okay? Make it your business to read and digest this. Put a star by that, in other words. Ear mold types and material, lucite skeleton versus full shell silicone. Remember that from last week? And then we talk, there's three different acoustic modifications, non-electronic, and last week we went over venting. Today, we'll finish off filtering and horns. Those are easier, okay, but a lot easier. Venting is used a lot today. Remember last week, too, we talked about venting. I'll stop sharing here for a second. Here's the vent in, in an ear mold, and we also showed you select events. And I showed you that this vent here, look at the big hole, if I can show that to you here. Kind of hard to show. Okay, look at the big hole there, right? There, I'll point with my pen or pencil right here. See, I can put the pen, pen in that hole, okay? That, that's the hole. And in that hole, you would choose as a clinician one of these plugs. And looking closely at these, you can see that they may have bigger or smaller holes in them. See that? Select event. And it's really kind of a tension. There's a, you have to be careful. You can't just select the widest vent, otherwise, Sound too much sound may bounce out and leak out of the vent and get picked up by the mic. Amplified, hit the eardrum, leak out the vent, picked up by the mic. That vicious circle is called what? Feedback. Okay. Today's digital hearing aids all also though have automatic feedback reduction. They actually produce a sound. Get this: the hearing aid actually makes a sound that's out of phase with the high frequency sound that would cause feedback. And what are two sounds that are opposite in phase do? They produce the sound of one hand clapping, silence. So we use automatic feedback reduction today too, but in, you'll study more of that next year when you cover a hearing aid course called 240, Compression and Digital Features in Today's Hearing Aids. Anyway, by the way, that word compression is a good one. Because that word means that many of today's hearing aids no longer have volume controls on them. Okay, volume controls, yes, you can make the sound louder or softer, but today we use something called compression, and compression automatically changes the amplification. The word amplification is called gain. More gain, more amplification, less gain, less amplification. So if the input to the hearing aid is very soft, the hearing aid automatically produces more gain, and as the input to the hearing aid gets louder, the hearing aid reduces the gain automatically. And the reason why is because as you've learned in anatomy class, 
with hearing loss, your floor of hearing sensitivity goes up, but your loudness ceiling of tolerance doesn't change. So hearing aids have to amplify soft sounds by a lot, but loud sounds by very little, okay? Compression, you'll learn more about that in 240 as well. All righty, so let's share a screen. Go to our notes. Venting you've covered last week. So let's hone in on filters. Filters is the second acoustic, non-electronic acoustic modification. If we show you a picture of filters here, filters, we said filters are kind of the, you can equate filters to damping. They mainly affect the mid frequencies. You'll see venting affecting mostly the lows, filters or damping changing the mids, and horns, the real effect is in the highs. And here would be venting on the left. Here would be filters or dampers. That's what we're covering now. And look at horns. See how the two millimeter diameter gets wider? This would be number 13 tubing and it gets wider, much like a horn. Okay, I'll show you a picture, I'll show you a real one in just a second here, but we're covering these two now, okay? Filters and horns are not used as much today as they used to be. <coughs> Excuse me, hearing aids today are mostly digital. And because with digital technology, we can do so many things, we don't have to rely that much on filters or horns in, in the ways that we used to when hearing aids were analog. And that word used to isn't all that long ago. It's only like 20 years ago, but it's not that long ago, really. But there's select events, the effect events that we covered last week, mostly in the lows, filters. Now, hearing aids, this, this is a picture of a fictitious frequency response from a fictitious imaginary hearing aid. Okay, we'll just call it hearing aid X. And as this is a spectrum, just like you've learned earlier on in unit one and in unit three in this very same course where we talked about waveforms versus spectrums. And we said that the, the axes of a waveform, time and amplitude, okay, when you're looking at a spectrum, it's frequency and amplitude. Remember, amplitude is always the spoiled one. It's got, it's seen on both of these ways, and it's always on the vertical axis. Anyway, look at this picture. You've got frequency along the horizontal. You've got decibels, SPL, output, dB, SPL, output. Now, the words input, gain, and output, jot these down somewhere, okay? Because Input is the sound coming into the hearing aid, whether it's a whisper, average speech, loud traffic noise, whatever, input. Input is always measured in dBSPL. Always, always, okay? Why? Because it's referenced to an absolute value, zero, okay? It's referenced to zero dBSPL. Remember, anything in SPL is an absolute dB value referenced to the ground of zero. Gain is added to the input, and gain is what the hearing aid is amplifying. So input, I should say, is what the hearing aid is amplifying. So the, the amount of amplification given by a hearing aid is called the gain. So input plus gain, what the hearing aid is increasing, okay, equals output. And output is what's hitting your eardrum. Output is the sound coming out of the speaker of the hearing aid. It's what's coming out of the ear mold of the hearing aid. Input's going into the mic. The hearing aid's providing gain. And output's coming out of the mold. Okay? Output is also measured in dBSPL. So input and output are always measured in dBSPL, whereas gain is just measured in simple dB. And I, I'm reiterating something that we learned way back before your midterm in unit two, okay? You can't add two SPLs together. Those are both absolute values. A machine making 90 dB SPL and another machine making 90 dB SPL, assuming the machines are different, 
combining them together is a total of 93. So 90 plus 90 is 93. So that must be a gain of 3 dB because 90 dB SPL plus 3 dB of gain equals 93 dB total. Okay? Input plus gain is the sum total. Gain is relative. Gain, unlike inputs and output, gain is a relative value. I can add 50 dB of gain to a 10 dB SPL input. I can add 50 dB of gain to a 20 dB SPL input. I can add 50 dB of gain to a 30 dB SPL input, and so on and so on. And think about time, okay? If you're on central standard time, that's an absolute value. Okay, I'm on Pacific Standard Time. That's another absolute value. You can't add your time to my time. It doesn't make any sense. But you can take a relative time value of two hours. I can add two hours to my time. You can add two hours to your time. If, if it's 12 noon by you, it's add two hours to it. It's 2 p.m. Okay, so if I add, if it's 2 p.m. over by me and I add two hours to that, it's 4 p.m. So two hours is relative. I can add two hours to any time, but I can't add two different time zones. That doesn't make any sense. See what I'm saying? If it's, I can't add 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. That doesn't make any sense. But if I add two hours to 4 p.m., now I'm at 6 p.m. Okay? Okay, just anyway. Share screen. It's important to know the axes of hearing aid graphs. It really is, because that's what you're going to be looking at a lot in this field. Now, here's a hearing aid frequency response. In other words, it's spectrum. It's, this is what, you, if you took a slice out of the sound wave that this hearing aid is producing, okay, you'd see, oh, there's no time, right? A spectrum doesn't have time on it. It's a slice. So you're looking at frequency and amplitude, and you can see what this hearing aid is producing in your ear canal. About 100 dB SPL output in the low frequencies, and then a peak output of around 120, right at about 1,000 hertz, and then another little peak, and a third peak, and a fourth peak, and a fifth peak. Oop. It's a typical frequency response. It's typical maximum output of a hearing aid coming into a person's ear canal. It, this is fictitious. It could be any, you can shape this any which way you want, okay? But this is just some imaginary output of a hearing aid. And these peaks come from resonances inside the hearing aid. Literal resonances from inside. If you took a look at this BTE and if you opened it up, You'd see all kinds of guts and things inside of it, okay? Well, the resonances of the, of the guts of the hearing aid. Simply look at it like that. Good. So s filters are meant, are little screens. And filters are put into to usually into the ear hook of the hearing aid. So let me show you a, an actual filter in a hearing aid. See that little red thing? inside the ear hook right here right there that's a filter then if you looked at it closely it's a screen a tiny little screen put into the hearing aid why would they want to do that well let's read our notes what do filters do okay you can have coarse screen or a fine screen and then they stick it inside the ear hook what do filters do? Well, first of all, how are they measured? How are vents measured in millimeters of diameter, right? How big is the hole? How many millimeters? We said a tiny vent is one millimeter. A big vent is four millimeters in diameter. That's what we said last week. And the bigger the width of the vent, the more the, the lows are let out, right? And what are vents for? People who've got good hearing in the low frequencies and poor hearing in the highs. Because people who have good hearing in the low frequencies, when you plug up your ear, you're going to hear the occlusion effect. Someone with poor hearing in the lows isn't going to have the occlusion effect. Okay? So, filters is the second non-electronic acoustic modification. And what do filters, how are they measured? In terms of ohms. And ohms it is resistance. And resistance is futile. No, I'm just, impedance, remember that word we covered in the first half of the course? Opposition to sound? 
It's the opposite of resonance. And what are the three parts to impedance? Opposition due to mass. If something has mass, it's going to let lows resonate it, but it's not going to let highs through. If something is stiff, it's going to resonate with highs, but it's going to oppose lows. So you have opposition due to mass, opposition due to stiffness, and the third part is resistance, okay? Like simple friction. So any object that transmits sound is going to have resonances, and what it doesn't resonate with is it's impeding. impeding. Impedance is the flip side of resonance. A frown is an upside-down smile. A smile is an upside-down frown. So opposition due to mass is very frequency-specific because it doesn't let highs through. Opposition due to stiffness is very frequency specific. It doesn't let lows through. But impede, I should say, resistance is simply equal in any object. The resistance is equal for all frequencies. So, hearing aids tend to produce peaks in the mid to high frequencies. And the biggest peaks in hearing aids are found around the mids. Filters are going to dampen or reduce the peaks wherever the peaks may be. Filters are resistors, so they're, they're acting independently of frequencies. <clears throat> so because they're acting independently of frequencies, no matter where the peaks are, they could be in the lows, they could be in the mids, they could be in the highs, it doesn't matter. Filters are going to reduce the peaks. And in as much as the hearing aids produce most peaks in the mid to highs, that's where the effect of filters will be seen, mostly in the mid to highs, because the resonances of the internal guts of a hearing aid are mostly from the mid to the highs. So the greater the ohms, the more the reduction of the peaks. Okay. Now, this slide, you don't need to know. It's just saying where the filters were placed. If the filter was placed in the ear hook, if the filter was placed at the end of the ear hook, if the filter was placed in the tubing, which it never is these days, or further in the tubing, this would be the changes of the effect of the filter. Well, we're not going to worry about that because nobody does that today. If filters are used, they're put in the ear hook. So leave that one alone. This is a picture showing you the effect of horns. Now, horns, look on the left. Imagine this being two millimeter wide, number 13 tubing, okay? A horn is flared out. And the flaring out of a horn increases the highs. If I show you a picture now of a horn or an actual horn, I'm just going to show you a number 13 tubing shoved into a yellow EAR plug, okay? This was meant to act as a stock ear mold ugly, but just to test on someone's ear before the person bought a hearing aid, okay? But I'm showing you this because I, I want to show you that this may have two millimeters of diameter, this little hole here. Where can I show you this? Uh, okay, that little hole, two millimeters diameter. But if I turn here, look at how wide that got. Okay, that's three millimeters diameter. This is two. So you're looking at a horn. Okay, it's getting wider. When you think of a horn, okay, it's getting wider. Okay, and that increases the high frequencies. If I do the opposite, I'm decreasing the highs. I'm using a reverse horn, wider at my mouth and narrower coming out. Just as I think I showed you last week, if we take a piece of paper and you roll it up and you make a horn, okay? So if you make a horn, if I start talking into the wide end of the horn, I'm muffled up, okay? But if I speak into the small end of the horn and it flares out, you can hear my high frequencies better. That was the idea behind horns, okay? The third and final non-electronic acoustic modification. On the left, a horn, okay? On the right is a reverse horn, and that would decrease the highs. All right. So here's the effect of horns. 
as I, if I have a reverse horn on the bottom, I'm cutting out the highs. If I make, if you look at the middle and keep it all two millimeters diameter, you might have the middle frequency response. And if I flare it out, I'm increasing the high frequencies. Okay? So, there we have it. Let's read in our notes what we've got from the top here, from filters. Not used much anymore. Their purpose was to smooth the frequency response peaks and reduce feedback. Yeah, feedback, because feedback occurs from these high frequency peaks in the frequency response of a hearing aid. Remember, highs bounce, lows bend. Little tiny high frequency sound waves can leak out of the vent and get picked up by the mic and create feedback. So filters was a common way to reduce those peaks. They also reduce the harshness of a hearing aid and the sharpness of the sound quality, but also tended to reduce the gain a little bit. Filters reduce feedback caused by sound leaking out from the receiver, bouncing off the eardrum and being picked up by the mic. Feedback is especially caused by peaks in the high frequency, and they shouldn't say gain, it should say output. Highs bounce, <clears throat> lows bend. Reduction of feedback allows a client to turn up the volume control more without getting feedback. Filters cause acoustic resistance, which is independent of frequency. Filters are resistors, thus they are measured in ohms, not in frequency. More ohms is more resistance, is more smoothing of the peaks. Many audiologists mistakenly thought filters were measured in frequency. The largest peak in a BTE is at around 1,000 hertz. Lucky, lucky, around 1,000 hertz, okay? And what do filters do? They dampen the peaks wherever the peaks may be. So in as much as the biggest peaks are found around 1,000 hertz, filters were said to have their greatest effect in the mid frequencies. But that's just because 1,000 hertz filters, 1,000 hertz peaks, are found in BTEs, okay? 1,000 hertz filters just happen to reduce 1,000 hertz peak in a BTE frequency response. Basically, just take away that word saying 1,000 hertz. I'll do it right here. Get rid of it. Filters just happen to reduce the 1,000 hertz peak in BTE frequency response, but they are measured in ohms. An old way of creating filters was literally taking a little bit of a, a, a fabric pill from an old sweater and sticking it in the mold of the ear, in the uh, ear hook. Lamb's wool. Huh. The oldest type of filter, like a small screen. Very effective at reducing peaks, but you can't really control the amount of ohms that way. So filters used to be produced in different colors. White was a 680 ohm, red was 2,200 2, ohms, so you have more <clears throat> resistance. Location of filters at the small end of BTE ear hook. In ITEs, often lateral to the receiver. In ITEs, in other words, inside, I'll show you, in ITEs, it would be behind that white thing, okay, in, just medial to it. You wouldn't be able to see it. Okay. Sharing screen again. Problem with filters is that they got clogged up with perspiration, so the person would have to replace them. Note on PowerPoint slides where filters were seen on BTEs and ITEs. But back up for a line, you can't clean filters. All you could do was replace them. So if we take a look, see at where we are here. BTE, basic parts of the BTE, have a look. All right, the mic, this would be the receiver, the speaker, the ear hook, the number 13 tubing, ear mold, vent, battery compartment, OTM, off, telecoil, microphone, meaning on because in English, off and on both start with O, so they had to use a different letter for M for, for uh, turning the hearing aid on. Volume control, all right, and again, mic, and here would be the receiver, the battery door, battery case, number 13 tubing, ear hook, okay, ear mold, and this would be the vent. 
Location of filters. Sometimes you'd see them here in the tubing, but rarely. Mostly they were put in the ear hook, as I showed you. Here's number 13, tubing itself. You'll be learning how to modify ear molds, changing the tubing sometimes. Here's a thin tube, open fit BTE. Smaller, tiny thin tube as compared to this, okay? These are meant for severe hearing losses. These BTEs are meant for mild to moderate hearing losses. <clears throat> Occlusion effect is reduced because there's lots of venting happening here. Sound is literally going through the tube and into the guy's ear canal. Thin tube, okay? Look at how it's sitting there. There's that wire that I keep showing you that kind of hooks inside the conchable of the hearing aid. There's the wire shown on the left. Okay, hearing aid in place, shown on the right. This is not an ear mold, it's just a stock dome. And you could change the dome on the hearing aid. If you wanted less venting, you chose a dome that had fewer holes in it. Thin tube effects though. What they do, of course, would be reducing the highs, wouldn't they? They're acting like a reverse horn, because they're thin. So the hearing aid has to know this. The hearing aid, here would be the sound output from a regular tubing, number 13, with two millimeter diameter. But when you're using thin tube, that's the opposite of an ear horn. So you're really plugging things up, aren't you? So the hearing aid's got to produce this back again, plus, okay, so that's hearing, thin tube hearing aids. That's the problem with them, okay? Receiver in canal looks much the same as a thin tube hearing aid, you would hardly notice the difference, ex in except that in the tubing, you've got wire. And you can actually see the wire. And then the speaker or the receiver is inside the ear canal, no longer in the hearing aid at the end of the ear hook, okay? No longer there, it's now in the ear. And here's your stock ear mold with its dome with lots of venting. So here's a picture of an actual, again, here's a receiver in canal. Look at the wire. Okay, RIC, R I C. Very, very handy. Okay, very invisible. Okay, both thin tubes and RIC hearing aids are very, very cosmetically oriented. And they are by far the most common hearing aids sold today. And notice this hearing aid doesn't even have a volume control on it. It's got a mic, okay, but no volume control. It's using compression. This one might have a volume. I don't think so. No, I think that's, no, that's probably just a program switch. I don't even think that's a volume control either. Many hearing aids, yeah, that, yeah that's not a volume control, okay. <clears throat> So the mic of the hearing aid would be here. The receiver in this case would be here, but that's because it's a thin tube BTE. The RIC hearing aid, mic is over here, but the receiver is in the ear. Just food for thought, stop sharing. Let's go to our notes and finish our notes on horns. Whoa, okay, take that. Yeah, thank you, just gotta get to the notes here. Okay, horns. Not used much in today's digital hearing aids. Flaring causes an increase in high frequency gain, reduces the impedance for the high frequencies. Experiment with rolled up paper for yourselves. Location of horns at the end of BTE ear mold tubing. In ITEs, it was at the end of the casing surrounding the receiver. Now, how would I show that? Well, if I was to have had a horn in this, it would mean that around this white thing, the shell casing would, have, would be like a horn. It would kind of flare, okay? They would seat this white thing further in, like a little bit further in to the, I can show you, like maybe over here, and then it would flare out that way. But... Don't worry so much about that because horns are rarely used in today's hearing aids, okay? Today's hearing aids are digital, so we can flex, we can sculpt, we can shape that frequency response 
any which ding dong way we want. So we don't rely on horns much anymore. We don't rely on filters as much anymore. We can clear up those peaks in the frequency response digitally, but we do repeat DO, do use vents all the time. Okay, location of horns, larger horns can add up to 10 dB between 3000 and 6000 Hertz. Horns are very effective for those with pronounced high frequency hearing loss. The most common horn was called a three millimeter Libby horn for BTE ear mold tubing. Tubing in BTEs, for regular BTEs where lots of gain is required, the most common tubing is number 13, two millimeters in diameter. More width gives more highs like horns. More length gives more lows. Don't worry about that. Client with high power BTEs, beware of old, narrow tubing. What do I mean by that? You'll get some people coming into your clinic wearing high power BTE hearing aids with conventional number 13 tubing, two millimeter diameter, but the tubing is old and it's no longer flexible very much. It's become stiff and now it's become narrower as well. It's shrunk. So this tubing here can sometimes get, get narrower than two millimeters. It may kind of collapse on itself. You need to replace that tubing. You take a pliers and you twist, you pull the tubing out of the ear mold. You clean out the hole in the ear mold with a reamer. You take glue, you put in new number 13 tubing. You pull it through snip off the end, and Bob's your uncle. You'll learn how to do that. But that's uh, essentially tubing replacement. Very important for HIS to know how to do that. Okay. Heavy walled tubing is meant for, to be really thick. It gives greater durability, but smaller internal diameter, sometimes up to 30% smaller. May reduce feedback, but may reduce highs too much as well. Some tubing is called antiperspiration tubing looks a little bit more translucent, reduces beads of moisture that can gather in the tubing because beads of moisture can easily clog up the receiver of a hearing aid. Think about it. Okay, just imagine if you've got beads of perspiration inside the tubing because you've worn the hearing aid and you're sweating and you get moisture crawling up, it's going to plug the filter for sure, okay? That's, these are just maintenance issues, troubleshooting. Open fit tubing is about 0.8 to 0.9 millimeters in diameter. Note what this does to the frequency response. The highs are cut, so the hearing aid has to make up for this loss. Never confuse thin tube open fit BTEs with receiver in canal BTEs. They are different. And that's the end of our notes. That's the end of acoustics. Basically, share screen. Let's look at our PowerPoint here. All right, share screen. All right. Very, very important. Okay. So this would be the reduction of the highs a bit with the tubing. If I go all the way to home, let's look where we covered. Okay, last week. Position of taking a cotton or foam block in the canal, you're going to take an ear mold impression. It's got a bit of string on the end. You're going to fill up the canal with silicone and take a shape of the ear canal. You'll mix your materials together. You're going to push in that sponge with a tiny little light called an ear light. And that's what you're pushing the sponge in with is with this tip. Then you're going to mix your material together, put it in a syringe and hold it in the guy's ear and fill up the whole ear canal and the helix with ear mold impression material. You'll pull that out, you'll see the sponge stuck on the end. The sponge mainly protects the eardrum, so it's not, it isn't hit with the material. You have two bends in an ear canal, and an ear mold impression should always show the two bends. Manufacturers can always cut off excess. 
It's always better to produce too much. The manufacturer can take off what's not necessary. Ear mold impressions are done in order to create ear molds and also to create ITEs because this is a hearing aid built inside the ear mold, essentially, or ITCs or CICs. Okay, that's what ear molds are made for. Good. Here's the types of ear molds we covered last week. The main two to remember is the middle one here and the left one. The left is full shell because it, it fills the whole concha bowl. There's usually no vent, or if there is, it's a tiny pressure vent. It's made of silicone. And on a BTE hearing aid, it would be for profound or severe hearing loss so that no sound can leak out and get picked up by the hearing aid microphone, okay? So when you see someone walking around with full shell silicone ear molds, you will know that those are really for high, the guy's got a severe hearing loss. The middle one, a fair, bit, fairly big loss, but see the vent in it? It's usually made of lucite. The tubing may be the same, number 13 tubing. But the mold this time is called skeleton, and the material, plexiglass, okay? It's lucite. Don't worry about the other ones. When you're taking an ear mold impression, be careful that the person doesn't have any metallic gear in his or her ear. Make sure the earrings are off if it's inside the uh, concha bowl, because taking out the impression can be quite mean. Here's the effect of plugging up your, your open ear canal, that quarter wave resonator stuff at the beginning of your notes for this particular unit seven. Remember I said put a star by that. This is, that's what this is talking about here, natural ear canal resonance. When you plug up an ear with an ear mold, you've lost that resonance, so your frequency response you think may look like this out of the hearing aid, but it's actually going to look like this because you've lost some of that, that, that outer ear canal resonance. So that has to be made up again. Speech spectrum normally has more energy in the lows. Highs are softer, so you want to make sure you don't lose those highs. Very, that's why horns were used in hearing aids. Anything that you try to produce those highs. Because the sounds on an audiogram, speech sounds, whether you're looking at a spectrum in dBSPL or you're looking at an audiogram in dBHL, the high frequency sounds of speech are the softest here and here. Okay, both ways. Outer ear canal resonance and speech. This is the outer ear canal resonance shown here. Okay. And basically, because the ear is a quarter wave resonator, because like a cup open at one end, closed at the other end, okay, it's going to resonate with sound waves that are four times as long. Do the math at the beginning of the unit to figure it out. The outer ear adds decibels to high frequency consonants. That resonance is a gift. There's your three non-electronic acoustic modifications, venting, filters, and horns. And that's what we went through. Venting, filters, and horns. Select a vent. We discussed this last week. Parallel venting is always better than the bottom two. But sometimes you don't have enough real estate in a hearing aid, so you have to compromise. Read your notes carefully to find out what are the compromises exactly, with, especially with a diagonal vent. This is the effect of venting. You're reducing the low frequencies. The bigger the vent, the wider, the more the lows are reduced. Whether you're talking in dBSPL, oh, I hate that thing that always goes up here. I wish I could make it go away. Go away, thank you. dBSPL or DB and gain, doesn't matter, okay? You're reducing the lows. Filters are done to reduce the peaks wherever the peaks may be, and in as much as the peaks are usually in the low, to, uh, the mid to highs, that's where the action of filters will be. But remember, filters are 
resistors, and resistors are measured in ohms, okay? So filters have the biggest effect on mid to highs because that's where the biggest peaks in hearing aids are found. And then horns. Basically, that's it. All righty. Any questions, shoot me an email. But other than that, we are done. This is Itsky Pitsky for 110 Acoustics and Psychoacoustics. I'm glad we had the time this year to spend two weeks on Unit 7 rather than cramming it all into one week, as I have sometimes had to do in the past. So it's been a slice. Live long and prosper. I shall stop sharing here. I am recording, and I am about to hit stop recording. Good luck to you in the upcoming semester. I think some of you may be taking 125 disorders, and you might even be taking 150 fitting methods in the summer semester. So hopefully, if that's true, I will see you for 125 disorders, because that's the course I teach. Anyway, this is me signing off. Live long and prosper. Adios, amigos. Okay. Stop recording.